All right, hello, wine drinking people. We've got a special edition of Wine Watch Television here for you. One of the greatest winemakers in California history, Ed Sobraj. And Ed's been making wine for as long as I've been alive. I think you said you started working for Gallo in the 70s, early 70s. Yeah, you, I did. I was a chemist. When you were just 21 years old. Yep. Barely yep. old enough to drink wine. Well, I think back then the drinking age was 19. I think it switched right before I turned 21. But Ed's got his own label. He was winemaker, or still is winemaker emeritus to most people at Barringer. He still carries that flag around the world to promote that label. But his family's own vineyards in Sonoma and Napa since uh, the 1940s? Actually, Sonoma County. Sonoma County, just Dry, Sonoma. Dry okay. Creek Valley, that's where I grew up. And I went to that other valley to make wine for 32 years. And... Uh, they were very gracious to me and allowed me to keep my day job while I started my own brand, which I promised my dad I would do. So. And the first vintage of these wines were the 2004 vintage, and then you really got things rolling 2006. Well, I actually started in 2001. 2001? And by 2004, the one and the, the one Cabernet from Hell Mountain and the two uh, Gamble Ranch vineyard we're going to taste. Uh, I released in September 2004. Okay, so 01 was the first vintage, and then the releases were in 04. Yeah. And you went full time with your label 2007? 2000? We uh, bought the old Lake Sonoma Winery at the end of Dry Creek Valley in Sonoma County. It's about 70 miles north of San Francisco. And we um, um, opened, uh, we crushed April 15th of 2006. And Opened our tasting room November 15th. Okay, so now you can come out and visit Ed come at his own us. winery. All right. And we've got, uh, well, just six wines here today. How many wines do you guys make uh, under the Sobraja label? You should never let a winemaker own their own winery. I, <laughs> I make 11 wines. Um, okay. I wanted to make my own vineyards, and then I wanted to make some for my friends. I was going to say, that's not a lot. Some other wineries make, you know, 20 or 30 wines. Sure, sure. So well, 11, I like that. That's good focus there. Well, my son decided to join me in 2002 while I was still at Barringer, and he made a lot of these wines. So uh, he makes all the wine and I take all the credit now. Well, that's the way it should be. That's it what we have kids for, way. right? That's true. So we're going to start out today with the 2011 Home Ranch Chardonnay. 2011, uh, was that a good vintage for you guys? I mean, we heard it was actually it was disastrous. But... Well, it was a cold vintage. Um, after 2010, it was a very small crop. So when, you know, then 12 became a very beautiful vintage and a big crop. Two small vintages of vines were resting. If you picked them ripe, the wines actually were quite good. Cold vintages can make really flavorful, structured wines, and the 2011 Chardonnay is, is a pretty wine. And I think that's what you get out of this. You see a little bit of oak contact in this wine, which I like a little bit of new oak in my wine. To me, it's like the salt and pepper that Chef uses when they're making food. Uh, some people don't like it with wine, and some people don't like Chardonnay because they use oak with Chardonnay, but like I said, for me, Chardonnay is big enough to handle a little bit of new oak, because this wine is you still get some lovely uh, minerality in the wine also. It's not just like chewing on a two by four. The, the Gamble Ranch, which is between the Outfield and St. Helena. When we start traveling around, you see other people who've done things for a long time and it works. So, you know, I convinced uh, my, my old mentor, Mr. Nightingale, um, to um, barrel for a minute, malactic, and use new barrels, 100% new barrels, and age it. And, and we do something where we mix the leaves. It's called batonnage in France, and it resuspends the yeast. It kind of pulls out all the aggressive characteristics that I call winemaker interference. You end up with a lot of fruit, kind of like when you simmer a stew, with a nice, rich finish. You really get that in the nose in this wine. This wine's got a lot of ripe tropical fruit to it, a little bit of that butterscotch, vanilla creme brulee, and uh, you know, not overdone though. If you like oak, you're gonna love this wine. If you don't like oak, I would say you may want to go with the first wine, the Home Ranch, which to me is a little more balanced style, not as big and not as colder you know, climate. Cooler climate also. A little more structured. Um, and that's why you make two different Chardonnays. Yeah. If you made the same wine, it would be boring. We've got a little Merlot up next from the home ranch here, the 2009 vintage, which I love this vintage right now. This is a vintage to me that jumps out of the glass here right out after opening the bottle. Although these wines have been open for a little while, the plumminess is really starting to come out in this Merlot for me, which is what I love about Merlot. This was in vineyard, but I replanted it in 1996, and I, I looked hard and fast around me, and I saw and tasted wines that were really beautiful Merlots. And it's in a rocky clay soils close to the river, close to the Russian River, very cold. And I like cold climate Merlots anywhere in the world. And it produced a really nice fruity, cherry uh, flavored wine that had, could take a little bit of oak, about 30% new, and it, uh, I'm real pleased with it. I'm happy. 
got a lovely velvety texture. Another thing that Merlot I think is different. It's more in the front of your palate as opposed to the back of your palate with the tannins. And uh, yeah, lovely freshness in this wine also. A little cocoa spice and really nice Merlot, elegant style of Merlot. And it has a little touch of Cab Franc. A little Cab Franc from Mount Beater. Yep. Just a little bit because Cab Franc is a little blueberry kind of herbal characteristic in the nose and a little teeny slight bitterness in the flavor. So it elongates the finish of the Merlot. And then there's the Zinfandel, which I'm not a huge fan of Zinfandel, but this wine's got a little Carignan, a little Petit Syrah in it. So I uh, may think that adds a little bit of complexity to the Zinfandel. And you know, it is a pretty fresh style also. It has that ripe, jammy fruit when you first put it in your mouth, but then when you swallow it, it leaves your tongue salivating for another sip, so. Well, the old Italians liked field blends, and my dad planted this in 1957. Um, so this is over 50 years old. Technically, it would probably qualify for old vine old vine zin. Um, the nice thing about old zins is they get more uh, elegant, more rich, and less aggressive. So this wine, with the Kerrigan and the Petite, just make a nice balanced wine. Yeah, this is actually very good for Zinfandel. As good as a Zinfandel can be, just say that. Then we got two Cabernets here, and uh, very different stylistically. I think the difference comes partly from the vintage, but also, you know, the Andelson Vineyard here a little cooler climate, Monterosso, uh, a lot bigger. That's just the 2009 vintage, or at the site, or both of these two. Well, ten again, like I said, was a cold climate vintage, so the wines are a little more restrained, soft, round. Dry Creek in general is, and Sonoma County in general. You know, when I made wine in Napa Valley for so long, the two are very different. Being closer to the ocean, more with the cold air coming in from the Pacific, I think you get a little more softer, elegant wine, maybe a little bigger flavors, not as aggressive and tannic as you might in Napa Valley. So Andelson kind of epitomizes that and being in Dry Creek Valley, it, it produces a wine that's elegant and soft and very rich. Yeah, and Monterosso to me is a little blockbuster, man. This wine is uh, just jumps right out of the glass and this is why you know, they say great winemakers don't make wine, they let the wine make itself. But uh, if you're going to have six different wines, they should really speak about the place where they're from, which all these wines really do. Yeah, I mean, you know, my son Adam, uh, who's my winemaker, says this is a pitcher in a glass. And it, it definitely is a time and a place. And single vineyards should show and distinctly be different and show what that vineyard's all about. And uh, the other thing is, if you give two winemakers the same grape, they would make different wines. So, we make a certain wine from Monterosso, other people make Monterosso. It's a great vineyard that's been in vineyards um, since the 1880s. It's got to bring you back because you work for the Gallows, who own it now. Yeah, and uh, I, the vineyard manager actually was my dad's best friend, so I probably did more damage as a kid in that vineyard than anybody else <laughs> playing. So. All right, well, thank you very much, Ed. It's been great to have you here. Some fabulous wines. And uh, signing off for the Wine Watch, I'm Andrew Lampasoni. Remember, always drink the good stuff first.